AIDS has been the great plague of the end of the 20th century. Did it really start with a flight attendant designated at patient zero? Welcome to ReachMD Book Club. I'm your host, Dr. John Russell. We will be exploring this topic with author David Quammen as we discuss his new book, The Chimp in the River. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Good to be with you. So I know you've written a, another book called Spillover, which really talked about zoonotic diseases. You know, how did you decide to kind of focus this book in on AIDS? Well, this book grew out of Spillover. It's a section of Spillover that was written almost as a self-contained book when I was writing Spillover. I had been interested in the subject of zoonotic diseases, the ones that jump from uh, non-human animals into humans. And then I realized that, that AIDS itself, the whole AIDS pandemic, falls in that category, having having derived from the spillover of a single virus from one chimpanzee into one human in Central Africa. So I, I wanted to go to the origins of that story, both geographically, biologically, and historically. And that's what I tried to do in this book. You know, in the United States, we're, we're very kind of U.S.-centric, and we like to think that the AIDS epidemic started 1981 with the MMWR article of the, the folks with pneumocystis. Who was the first non-African patient felt to have died of AIDS in your research? The first non-African, well, there were a couple of people. There was a woman named Greta Rask uh, who had been working in Central Africa, in, in the Congo, uh, in, the, uh, in the 1970s. And she was, if I recall correctly, she was Danish, uh, sort of a medical missionary. And she got very ill and went home, as she said, I think it's time for me to go home to die. Uh, she had a total immune collapse, and she was showing some of the classic symptoms like pneumocystis pneumonia uh, and candida yeast, and, um, and she died in 1977 in Denmark. Uh, retroactively, we know, and I believe even from samples that have been retroactively screened, that she was one of the first recognized non-Africans to die of AIDS. But of course, the whole story is, is much older than that. So how did we first experience kind of AIDS in the United States in the late 70s, early 80s? Well, as you were saying, yeah, in 1981, there were um, a couple of reports of a strange immune dysfunction pattern among individuals. One came from Michael, one of these reports came from Michael Gottlieb in Los Angeles, and another one came out of New York, and uh, doctors were seeing uh, patterns of uh, immune failure. They were seeing pneumocystis pneumonia taking over people's systems. They were seeing Kaposi's sarcoma. They were seeing this candida yeast. And it all seemed to reflect immune dysfunction. And then there was a cluster study done, an epidemiological study that linked a number of these patients. I believe it was about 40 patients in all. And it was realized that they had a few things in common. They were active homosexual men. And they had, in some cases, they were connected by way of shared partners, shared sexual encounters. And there was one fellow who fell at sort of the middle of this cluster. And that was the flight attendant, uh, Gaten Dugas, Canadian. And he became, I, I think it's not unfair to say, demonized as the patient zero. But he was only patient zero in that cluster of 40. He was much, much uh, farther down the road in terms of the actual epidemic. He was patient, you know, 476,000 of 291 or whatever. The real patient zero had been in Africa much, much earlier. You know, and really in this, the seminal book and the band played on, the patient zero seemed to be this nice kind of villain. And you, in your research, it doesn't seem to, to be that way. Right. He was apparently a, a difficult and selfish person, but he was not the cause of the AIDS pandemic. He was, as I say in the book, um, AIDS had arrived in North America at a point when Gaten Dugas was still a virginal adolescent. It had come out of Central Africa. It had come to Haiti. That part of the story that we thought we knew was correct. Uh, it probably came to Haiti by way of uh, Haitian professionals who had volunteered to go to the newly independent Congo after its escape from Belgian colonialism. And so in the 1960s, Haitians were over there working, helping out uh, as professionals, civil engineers, teachers, doctors, etc. And then uh, they, were, they were told to get out. They were told by President Mobutu when he took over to get out. They went home to Haiti. Some of them had picked up the virus from Congolese wives or girlfriends. And, uh, and then eventually it moved from Haiti into the U.S. and around the world. So we've heard lots of theories in the United States about was it monkeys or chimps or where where do you think it really is the is the origin of kind of the AIDS virus in Africa? There is very good scientific work that has been done in the last 10 years by a couple of different teams, one led by Beatrice Hahn, then at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, 
what she did was using molecular phylogenetics, she pinpointed the, the initial spillover of the chimp came from a chimpanzee, the chimpanzee virus, the chimpanzee retrovirus into the first human victim. It had to have come in the southeastern corner of Cameroon because she learned that the chimpanzee virus is the precursor virus, simian immunodeficiency virus, we now call it. The, the strains in that part of Africa, the southeastern corner of Cameroon, most closely match the strains in humans. So we can, we can be confident with a high degree of precision that it came out of southeastern Cameroon. Then another fellow, Michael Warraby, did work to determine how long it has been in humans, and he came up with an, an earlier date than had previously been thought, as early as 1908, give or take a margin of error. Again, using molecular phylogenetics from archived samples of some of the first people who were HIV positive. He traced it back to its most recent common ancestor, the human virus, in 1908, give or take a margin of error. So, so that's the story I tell in The Chimp in the River, how this began around the the turn of the 20th century in the southeastern corner of Cameroon and gradually spread across the world. If you're just tuning in, this is ReachMD Book Club, and we're talking with author David Quammen about his new book, The Chimp in the River. So did the monkeys get sick? Is this a newer virus, so a 100-year-old uh, virus in humans? How long do we think it's been in the monkey world or the ape world? Well, again, for, for the pandemic strain of HIV, it's not monkeys, it's chimps that were the reservoir host. Uh, but the chimps seem to have gotten it from monkeys. There are precursors of this of the AIDS virus in lots of different species of monkeys, including the sooty mangabe, which is a smallish, uh, very um, bold monkey that's sometimes kept as a pet, sometimes killed for food in Central and West Africa. HIV-2, the less pandemic form, came from the sooty mangabe. HIV-1, group M, the pandemic strain that causes most of the AIDS around the world, came from a chimpanzee. And at first it was thought it did not make chimps sick, but then work with the chimpanzees of Gombe, Jane Goodall's chimps in, in Tanzania, revealed that, yes, this virus is pathogenic in, in chimps also. It destroys immune systems in chimps in a form of simian AIDS. In monkeys, where it, is, where it has probably lived for millions of years, it's non-symptomatic, but the, the chimps got it from monkeys in more recent uh, millennia, and it is still pathogenic for them. So how do you think it made the, the leap from chimps to humans? Well, this is only, uh, it can only be known inferentially, but Beatrice Hahn talks about the cut hunter hypothesis. The best guess is that what happened in southeastern Cameroon was that a hunter, probably a man, killed and butchered a chimpanzee, and in the course of doing that, maybe he cut himself on the hand or he had cuts on his back uh, And when he carried the chimpanzee. Anyway, somehow he got blood-to-blood -blood contact from that positive, virus-positive chimpanzee into his system through a, through a cut, and he became then the real patient zero, the first HIV-positive human. So, you know, from 1908 until 1978, how, how did it not kind of spread like wildfire through Africa? Well, first it was in villages of southeastern Cameroon. Sexual mores were different, and uh, there was not a great population density, and people died young of other causes. So it wasn't recognized, and it didn't spread very quickly. It barely, apparently, barely stayed alive. Um, reproductive rate of the virus was low, meaning that only about one person was infected for each person who had already been infected, only about one, on average, one transmission. So it simmered for years, even decades, and worked its way uh, through travelers down the rivers out of southeastern Cameroon, we think, we hypothesize, and got to the big cities on the main stem Congo River, Brazzaville, capital of French Congo in those days, and Leopoldville, capital of the old Belgian Congo. Leopoldville is now Kinshasa, and some of the earliest HIV-positive specimens came out of Leopoldville and Kinshasa. Uh, so we think it got there and uh, started to uh, spread more when it got to the big cities. Sexual mores were different. There was a greater concentration of people. And very importantly, people were being treated for venereal diseases, as we used to call them, STDs, with injectable drugs. And those drugs were being injected with uh, hypodermic syringes that were reused. So the reuse of syringes, the reuse of needles, may well, this again is inferential, but it's probable, may well have helped to jumpstart 
the epidemic once it got to the cities of, of Leopoldville and Brazzaville. I know there was an entire book that was dedicated to that perhaps the production of polio vaccine had spread it through the African continent. What's your thoughts on that? Right. That was a big book by a fellow named Edward Hooper, a journalist, and, and it accused um, a polio researcher, a Polish-American polio researcher named Hilary Kaprowski, uh, of having been responsible for starting the epidemic. The, this was a theory that had been around. There was an article published in Rolling Stone and then Hooper's book accusing Kaprowski of having developed a polio vaccine, an oral polio vaccine, using cells from chimpanzees that had been um, though he was unaware of this, had been infected with the, the simian virus, and that that virus then was a contaminant in his polio vaccine. So this was given some serious attention back around the year 2000. Even the Royal Society discussed it at a, as a meeting about the origins of AIDS. And then the work, uh, it, people doubted it then. There was no proof that Kaprowski had used chimpanzee cells. Um, and, uh, and then the work that came out from Michael Warby and Beatrice Hahn, uh, showing that it, the, um, the spillover had happened in southeastern Cameroon, which was not where Kaprowski was testing his vaccines, and that it had happened back in the early 20th century, long before Kaprowski's work exploded that. It was called the oral polio vaccine theory, the OPV theory, and it has now been uh, entirely discredited. So, so overall, in kind of looking at kind of what has happened to the African continent with regard to AIDS, have you been back there in kind of recent years to kind of see what, you know, what is happening in today's day and age? Well, I've been back there a couple of times in the last six months, but it was for a very different disease topic, and that was Ebola. I have not researched in the field the impact of AIDS on people in Africa, but we all know from the reports that have been done and the numbers that have been gathered that it has just been devastating. And it continues to be devastating for people in Africa, although it, we now know it's controllable with the, the modern drug cocktails for those people who can afford those cocktails. So that HIV-positive people in America and elsewhere in developed countries with good medical care are living much longer, living very good lives by way of the drug cocktail that controls the replication of the virus. But there are still people dying miserable deaths in Africa because they don't have access to those drugs. Why do you think so many zoonotic diseases have an origin on the African continent? Well, part of it is that there's a lot of biological diversity there. The Central African forests have high biological diversity, lots of different species of animals, plants, fungi, and bacteria. And some scientists estimate that for each of those, um, each of those kinds of organisms, there may be as many as 10 unique viruses for each species of bacteria, each species of, of rodent, each species of bat, maybe 10 unique species of viruses. So as we disrupt those ecosystems more and more, as population, human population grows and we're, we're cutting down forests and, and killing wildlife for food and shipping them around the world, um, we're giving these viruses the opportunity to take hold in humans more and more. There's nothing uh, uniquely unsalubrious about Central Africa. It's just the high diversity means that there are more opportunities for more viruses to leap from non-human creatures and become human viruses. So do you think this virus that started in the monkeys perhaps hundreds of years ago was some new combination of something that a monkey and a bat and something else kind of combined and, and kind of had this new virus emerge? You mean the SIV virus, yes. the HIV precursor? Yeah. Well, it seems to have been it's been found in about 40 different versions of it, found in about 40 different species of African primates. And in most of those, it does not seem to cause symptoms. It's probably been in them a long time. Uh, who knows where it came from a million years ago. But in chimpanzees, it's relatively new, and it's a recombinant form that seems to have come from two different kinds of monkeys. Now, chimpanzees prey on monkeys when they can. They'll catch monkeys and kill them, tear them apart, and eat them. So it seems to have gotten into chimpanzees by way of a couple of predation events on different species of monkeys. The viruses then recombined in chimps, and what we got from chimps was this recombined, relatively recent sort of hybrid version of this SIV, HIV virus, uh, relatively new to chimps and quite new to us. So there's, you mean, there's a lot of people in the United States that are worried about the next emerging disease coming from, you know, the next, you know, animal source and things like that. With all your research, is there anything that you're more worried about that's kind of out and about today? Well, people, sh it's right to be worried about it, that. It's right to be concerned about that because these things will continue to emerge as we come in contact with animals, as we disrupt ecosystems. And um, we're so interconnected now. These viruses can travel around the world 
at the speed of an airplane. Uh, it's not likely to be Ebola because Ebola is not a respiratory infection. It doesn't pass, uh, pass through the air, uh, although there's some confusion and controversy about that. But essentially that, that statement is, is true and, and reliable. Um, but there are other things like uh, the SARS virus that came out of southern China in 2003, which was a respiratory infection and which was quite virulent and quite lethal. Uh, it scared the bejesus out of public health officials, but we stopped it. Um, <laughs> but something like that, a single-stranded RNA virus, something that changes quickly, mutates very readily, uh, comes from animals, gets into humans, can pass through the air. And the other thing that would make it dangerous would be if it was something that caused people to be contagious while they were still ambulatory, so that people are walking around infected with this virus, passing this virus, but not so sick that they have to uh, collapse into bed. That combination, the fact that it would be transmissible through the air and the fact that it would be contagious before it brought really severe symptoms, those combinations could be uh, really dangerous, whether it's the next influenza or the next SARS-like virus, uh, and, and we might see a really severe global pandemic. Well, thank you so much, David, for being on the show. The book is The Chimp in the River, How AIDS Emerged from an African Forest. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Very good to talk with you, John. Thank you. Take care. This is Dr. John Russell. You've been listening to ReachMD Book Club. To download this program or others in this series, please visit ReachMD.com. Thanks again for listening.